Welcome back, darkness lovers, night sky gazers, and all you people that are out there that are part of the movement. We got great news for you today. The National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors, the members of that association, have created a new 501c3 corporation, the Lighting in Darkness Foundation. And the Lighting in Darkness Foundation is an institution that has been created from the grassroots of the lighting industry. And what we want to do is we want to create the capability and the ability in the field to restore darkness to our light polluted environments, to preserve night where it exists. So what I want you to do right now, I know it sounds crazy, I've never done anything like this before, but I want you to go to restoringdarkness.com. I want you to click the donate button. And I want you to get involved in this movement financially. That's right. Make a contribution to the Lighting and Darkness Foundation. What are we going to do? We're going to do a lot of things. We're going to create education. Okay. We're going to fund research. We are going to support initiatives on the ground that are looking to stop light pollution before it starts, preserve night. And we're going to look at it helping people restore darkness to our light polluted environments. So go to restoringdarkness.com right now. Check it out. Click the donate button right there at the top. And it would allow you to make a contribution to this movement that we all care about so much. So that's restoringdarkness.com. Now, ahead, we have a great show for you guys today. We have uh, Kimberly Arcand, Jill Johnson, and Stephen Loring from the Smithsonian. That's right, Smithsonian Institute. And we're talking about their latest exhibit, which is called so beautifully... Lights out, recovering our night sky. And it makes the case for darkness restoration and night preservation, which is what we're trying to do right here on this show, and which is why I'm so excited to get down to Washington, D.C. and check out the display myself, and we're going to go there uh, for sure. But we have something for you right now. The first person to sign up as a monthly donor to the Letting in Darkness Foundation for 50 bucks a month will receive an all-expenses paid trip with the host of the Lighting and Darkness Foundation, uh, Restoring Darkness podcast, uh, host Michael Colligan, to come with us and check out the exhibit. So go ahead right now, go to that donate button right now, click donate, and become a monthly subscriber. I mean, we can't get, there's nothing, I can't think of anything personally better to give to than this cause. It touches everything, folks. If you're into wildlife, if you're into spirituality, if you're into carbon emissions and, and carbon um, mitigation, energy efficiency, beauty, the, whole, the, the list just goes on and on and on and on. Folks, light pollution is pollution. It's not a metaphor. And so this foundation exists to stop the increase of light pollution and then to be, begin to reduce it. That's right. We're going we're gonna to solve the problem. We're not going to mitigate it. We're going to fix it. So go to restoringdarkness.com right now. Click the donate button. And hey, buy us a cup of coffee um, a day, a week, a month, whatever it is that you can, you can give to us. We really appreciate it. And we're going to put it to great work. But so before I get to the great folks at the, <laughs> the Smithsonian, which is going to be an, an incredible show, I want to tell you guys about the darkness news. That's right. Every week on this show... We're going to have the Darkness News Report with Scott Walker, And we're going to go through all the things that are going on in the world, all the different issues. We're going to discuss them. So without further ado, I give you Scott Walker of the Darkness News Report. Scott Walker, what's going on in the news with darkness these days? <laughs> Well, uh, I've grabbed a few things from the last three weeks just to get us started uh, with something big. But we'll start with the big one, which is that uh, the International Dark Sky Association has changed their name and their logo. It's just Dark Sky, one word, intercaps right now. And I was going through the archives and I realized that Texas actually spilled the beans, like the Texas branch of the IDA spilled the beans about two, three months ahead of this announcement by already changing their letterhead to just Dark Sky Texas. And I think at the time I wrote it off as, you know, Texas being Texas about it. <laughs> sure. Well, you know what? But we there. love the work they do down there at uh, Dark Skies International. Is that the new name, Dark Skies International? 
or Dark Sky International? Uh, that Dark Sky International is their government name. That's how they file their taxes. But mm-hmm. it's just Dark Sky. One word. <laughs> One word. Dark Sky. Okay. We love the yeah. work they do. Good luck with the name change. And uh, yeah, what else you got, Scotty? That's big news, though. I mean, uh, that's big news. They have. Uh, they're the leader in this movement. So we're looking at them for big stuff in the future. Well, speaking of, uh, they've also just certified the first Dark Sky site in Greece. This is on Mount Ainos. It's on the island of Kefalonia in the Ionian Sea. This is the smallest national park in Greece, and uh, the island is the sixth smallest island in the archipelago. And it's now been declared a Dark Sky Reserve. Dark Sky, Dark Sky Park. Reserve is like one rank up. <laughs> one rank up. Well, hey, they could go down the Greeks. Let's go. What else you got? <laughs> All right. So Axios has put together a little bit of data visualization for us, which is, uh, you know, this this will come up in the video edit. But if you're what, listening to the audio version, what we have here is a map of the United States, including Hawaii and Alaska. And it is color coded from white to very, very dark purple based on how far you have to drive to a area that is known to be at a bordal scale rank one or two. So hmm. you can see here that New Jersey, Connecticut, and Rhode Island all have to drive about 200 miles to see stars, mm. uh, whereas Maine, Utah, and Hawaii are already living in it. Mm. Isn't that interesting that you can, you know, the, 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 uh, the uh, a light pollution map you know, creating a light pollution map, reminding people that, hey, there's a whole universe up there and you might want to get in your car every now and then and contemplate it. I think that's wonderful. Who put that together? So this is a publication called Axios. They most they do a bunch of different news site, news uh, related content on the web. Beautiful. All right. Uh, speaking of light pollution, we're going over to Bosha. That's uh, an observatory, the oldest observatory in Indonesia. Uh, it's probably going to have to shut down due to light mm. due to pollution from the nearby city of Lembang. Uh, so they've already built a new uh, observatory about 1,800 kilometers away. But they're really hoping that the city can get its stuff together and start a sky glow reduction campaign and keep this, ob- this you know, historic building up and running. When it was its intended bu- purpose. When was it built? Uh, 1921. 1921 has been... a 102-year-old observatory. 102-year-old yeah. observatory is about to become a wash in light pollution. I mean, that's a tragedy, and we can fix it. And I think that, you know, um, I think the people there and, and along with the, the technology we have today can solve that problem. So let's get after it. What else you got, Scotty? Uh, so uh, the Tibetan t- Plateau, you know mm-hmm. it, the third pole. Sure. Uh, but incredibly biodiverse re- region. The Chinese Academy of Sciences has tracked that since 1991, light pollution in the region has more than tripled. Hmm. And um, simply because of development. That's just just development. urbanization of the region. That's it. Bad development. You know, I mean, I think that's the case everywhere. When they talk about light pollution going up at 10% a year, you're talking about um, you know, the ability for LEDs to produce uh, way more light with much less electricity. And so people use more light um, in these remote areas. And that's, that's something we have to address. The foundation has to get to that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is something we all have to build. Uh, but mm. look, looking at somewhere a little closer. So, uh, Mike, you might remember Leamington, Ontario. Sure. The uh, cannabis greenhouse, big old purple haze bomb. So ever since Leamington has passed their lighting bylaw requiring that greenhouse to have curtains, we're seeing mm-hmm. every town in southern Ontario look at their lighting bylaws and seeing if they've got one, seeing what they can do. I'm going to bring you two stories. Caledon, Ontario is in the process of addressing a light pollution bylaw. This is a general sky, low mit- sky glow mitigation measure. Uh, one member of city council has pushed it out, and Public Works and the Legal Committee are working on drafting something right now. On mm. the other side... Brantford, Ontario, has a new nuisance lighting bylaw. If you complain to your neighbors about your neighbor's lighting to the city, that neighbor will have to buy a shield for any fixture that is shining onto your property. I prefer the anonymous letter, personally, than getting the... uh, (laughs) I mean, there is that. (laughs) Than getting the government involved. I mean, uh, you know, just personally, you know, there's a lot of ways to do this without you know, getting people in trouble or finding out who everyone is and all that. And we can do that with polite 
positive anonymous letters to our neighbors where we say, hey, look, your light is really bright. It shines into my house. Do you mind dimming it, turning it off, or changing it? Um, and it's very effective to do that, folks. Um, but you know what? I think we need to emphasize the incremental nature of this movement, Scott. So you, you brought up a bunch of examples there where one city decided to do this and then someone else decided to capitalize on that and go to the next place. That's where we need to go with this thing, Scott Walker. It has to be incremental. This idea of transformational change. Well, transformational change is 30 years in the making with this movement. So we have to begin to restore darkness, shielding those greenhouses, not shutting down the greenhouse. By all means, let's have the nice tomatoes or food or cannabis, whatever they're growing in that thing. But let's shield it. Let's begin restoring darkness. Great work. What else you got? All right. So uh, there's a proposed nickel and copper mine in the upper peninsula of Minnesota that would mm -hmm. uh, have would uh, threaten the light, uh, the darkness around the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. So that's a mm -hmm. state wilderness. You can have canoeing, fishing, uh, real great space, I've been told. But... Uh, the entire state is going to be, the state government is now reviewing light and noise pollution rules for that construction, for mines in general throughout the state. And is that going to lead to a reduction in light pollution from this mine? Uh, well, that's what, that's what people are hoping for. We'll see what have we'll see, again, this is a rule we have to keep an eye on. It's just the process is just starting. But as we watch this, this is where the Lighting and Darkness Foundation is going to come in. We're going to, we're, we're going to try to intervene in these debates. We're going to try to insert knowledge into these debates. So that, that's exactly what's needed right now is people where we can get boots on the ground that know what they're talking about, that aren't looking to say, hey, we're not telling anybody you can't have a mine here. That's not where we're, we're not interested in any of that. Um, but what we want to do is say, hey, there's a better way to do lighting. And we have lighting controls and fixtures and all these other things that we can do. And you can do it smart. And you can do it from the beginning, right off the top, before you even build. And that way, you're already there. And so that's where, that's where I think the foundation comes in, Scott. That's exactly what we're going to do is help those people there in that town or in that area. And the little bugs right. and bats that's... and everything else that lives in that area. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, well, I mean, fireflies... Fireflies need some love, too. Yeah. Uh, Texas, the Commission on Environment Quality, is going to be strengthening environmental regulations near concrete plants. This is after a new plant got built in Gunter, Texas. That's a little outside Dallas. And they're looking at not just the sound from these plants, the dust, but also light pollution regs coming out of these plants right now. And the entire state, what's going to happen? We're going to see a change in how concrete is made in Texas. Well, I mean, if we can preserve night and restore darkness to those areas, I don't think it changes the concrete one bit. That's, and, and that would be my point with this movement. I mean, you know, it's very, the guys, this is not complicated. It's not, it, this is not a, a, um, a no concrete argument. What this is, is that we're talking about light pollution and abating it. And so get on board. Don't fight it. Concrete plants out there. Don't fight this. Let's get on board. This is beautiful. You know, I mean, and, and, and you know, like we all need concrete. We all need cement. We drive on roads. We build houses. We got sidewalks we walk on. We need the concrete. But we need you concrete makers. We need you guys to reduce your light pollution. All right. Speaking of concrete, let's talk about the Arizona border. So mm. all of, there's, about, there's about 50 miles spread across five different spots already controlled by the state. Some of these are wildlife preserves. Some of these are a monument. But what these are is... An area of the Arizona Sonora uh, border that will be home to 802 what they're calling stadium style lights. Uh, and if these turn on, a report has determined that this would be devastating to wildlife in those regions. Again, this is a state wildlife preserve with stadium style big honk and bright lights pointed into Mexico. And what's the goal of the lighting? What's it supposed to do? Oh, I think it's just, I mean, it, it's its a deterrent to any sort of goings-on along the border. Mm. And yeah. And, whether and that I mean, be people or, I guess, pumas, deer, antelope. Yeah. Monarch it, butterflies. What I, what I would say is that, you know, sometimes these, these human priorities that we have, um, you know, we have to step back from them and realize that. Do you really want to have a line from space that outlines the United States and Canada, you know, with light on our borders. Is that necessary? Does that actually, um, re you know, um, mitigate or reduce the things that you're trying to stop from happening? And then what is the damage? And I think that 
you know, people in the past have not considered light pollution pollution. In this case, it is. And I think we need to look at it and, and decide whether we want to have prison yards along the border of the United States, prison yard lighting along the borders of the United States and Canada, outlining everything from space so people can see these sort of stuff. I think it's ridiculous. It needs to be looked at. It needs to be reconsidered what the purpose of the light is. All right, we're going to jump. Well, speaking of the purpose of lighting, we're going to jump over to southwest Florida. we got four counties, Sarasota, Menti, <coughs> Pinellas, and Collier County, and People that own seaside property there have access to free, free new new lighting. Amber, nice amber fixtures for sea turtle nesting and hatching season. Everyone been loves the put turtles. Together by these, gotta love the turtles. This is put together by the Sea Turtle Conservancy and the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Hmm. And so the, the towns are actually giving away the dark sky fixtures that people would need to help contribute to this yeah any any project under 25k you fill out a form and you can get your amber lamps you can get shielded fixtures you can get what you need to respect the turtles and the seashore is that our first example that you've seen in the news of an incentive program to restore darkness and preserve night uh Recently, yeah. I mean, obviously, we have tons of awareness building campaigns during migration season for birds, but this is uh, this this program's been going on a few years now. But this is really the big one where we have Floridians having access to, you know, the lighting that really respects the needs of the wee baby turtles. I'd love to interview somebody on the Restoring Darkness show here about that how they did yeah. that which fixtures they chose you know what's available to the people on the end and the end because i think incentives play a big part in this um there's the carrot we and there's the stick and so sometimes we need to say to people you know look at uh, you need to turn your lights off why because i'm a bylaw officer for the town of whatever and there's your thing you need to get that turned off or you need to change that light to be shielded and there's a, the incentive which is where hey you know what these use a lot less energy and they produce um, uh, lower Kelvin temperature lighting, and it has a timer on it or something like that, whatever it is, and it allows for other living things to coexist with us in peace. I mean, it's such a wonderful thing, but I think we need to think about think about incentive programs a lot. So good, good on Florida. All right, so we got a little research from the University of Sussex, which mm. uh, put glowworms in a maze and then subjected them to LED style, LED lighting. And what happens is the glowworms can't find each other, which means they cannot get mating. They, the light distracts them from finding, they use the glow as a mating display, they can't find each other, and we see a population reduction in glowworms. So we're literally blinding the glowworms um, in terms of their yeah, ability to... Killing the, You're killing the mood. Killing the mood. Killing the mood. Dim those lights down, buddy. It's too bright in here. Nobody wants to make love. <laughs> ah, man, this issue's the best. It's so awesome. I just oh, love yeah. talking about this. What else you got in the news there, Scott? All right, so jumping out, still in the UK, we're going to jump over to the University of Exeter, as, and they've mm -hmm. found that seaside light pollution is confusing the coastal woodlouse, which is this sort of crustacean. Uh, that can change color to avoid predators, and the amount of brightness is messing with how they change color, and it's just making them a target for, you know, your your coastal birds and your larger fish that snatch them up. What a tragedy. I mean, we think about, you know, when, when people, um, you know, talk about don't buy a dog, adopt a dog, or whatever. You have these things out there. You don't want to, you know, go to the local pound. Why are we allowing these, what are they called? Coast, coastal wood lice. The coastal wood lice to be picked off like that by the birds. Oh, we don't care about the coastal wood lice. Well, maybe there's a lot of reasons to care about them. And so these are ecosystems. And, you know, how much more beautiful, like you're talking, this is the one problem I have with it. It's like, why do you want to push all your light out onto the ocean and onto the, onto the beach and all these different places? Like, isn't that a waste? Do you really need it? You know, and, and so I really, I really, I really hope that as we restore darkness and this found the work the foundation is going to do, I really hope we can, um, eliminate that kind of thing. That's something I want to, I want, and I want people to want to do it. That's the other thing. Like, can we convince them and persuade them? 
I care about okay. the wood lice, so, Scott speaking Walker. Of some, yeah, like uh, speaking about something uh, a little, a lot bigger and a little closer to home, the Quinney College of Natural Resources in Utah has found that mule deer prefer to cross roads at their darkest points, which mm. means they are more likely to be struck blind by headlights and then struck by the car behind those headlights. And we've got a call from the uh, State University of Utah to even up, dim, and shield the highway lighting so that, you know, deer can get by on their own. You know, e- e- deer and headlights, um, you know, aren't we all? I mean, if we looked at ourselves personally, you know, all this light pollution, is it affecting us? Like, we look at it as always, oh, the mule deer, the uh, sea lice, whatever the heck you were talking about. They change colors. It doesn't affect us. Maybe we're like deer in the headlights now, the fact that all this light pollution. And how does it affect us? Does it have anything to do with the problems in our society? I think it does. And that's why we need to restore darkness. All right. And now we're going to talk about car collisions among humans. So we've got mm. some great data from the University of Leeds in the UK. And so they've been able to take crash data on the city's highways from before they switched. Uh, this is a switch from low pressure sodium to quartz metal halide. So eight years before, eight years during, and currently eight years after under the new lighting. And we found that the brighter bluer lighting you get from the metal halide is not notably changing crash statistics over the hmm. course of this whole thing. So, so and just for, for those that are not lighting people listening to this, um, metal halide is a pre-LED technology. But it produces high color rendering, and it's white color. So it's white in color. So it produces a 4,000K or 5,000K. I can't remember exactly which one, but it produces a higher whiteness type of light at a very high color rendering index. And low-pressure sodium is a very orange-colored light that has a very low color rendering index. And so the natural instinct for humans is to believe that, hey, it's whiter light, I can see better. But what we know is true is that is that that axiomatic presupposition is not necessarily true and more investigation is needed. And this study where you're literally switching from a orange colored light bulb, and that means pumpkin orange, folks, you're switching from orange color at a color rendering of 22% to a white colored light source at a color rendering of 70 or 80%. So much better when humans look at it to say, I prefer that light source. It doesn't mean that you can see better. Isn't that interesting, Scott Walker? Wow. Yeah. And, that, and that's the case. And it's interesting to see that happen. And we'll see what happens when Leeds switches all 80,000 of their lamps to LED in 10 years and what that does to those numbers. I don't. Hmm. We'll, well we will see. Uh, they're going to be, sw- if they're metal halide now or if they haven't been switched already. Um, it's coming, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're, we've also got some findings from the University of Wisconsin School of Medic- Medicine and Public Health, finding that pancreatic cancer cells disrupt the circadian clock. So normally when we talk about this, and this will come up in the future, I'm sure, we talk about how circadian disruptions lead to cancer cells forming and growing. And this is actually working the other way around, that you develop pancreatic cancer, it changes your circadian clock, and then that that change allows the accelerated growth of those cancer cells. Isn't that interesting about the liver, eh? So the liver or the pancreas, which is attached pancreas to pancreas is not a liver. <laughs> but it's close to your liver. It's interesting how like how little we know about how the human being works. You know, that's just humbling. Because shouldn't they already know that? No, they don't. They're discovering it now. And so we have these organs in our bodies that are digesting food and they are affected by the light and the darkness in which we receive. And they create our effect, according to this article. It creates whether or not we're able to handle the day-night cycle. And it seems like pancreatic cancer is a, is a circadian disruptor. That's basically what the article says, right? Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. That's correct. Wow. And it accelerates right, well, the growth of Speaking of, of the other... Circadian disruption caused by the pancreas after it's cancerated or has cancer or whatever actually accelerates the rate of tumor growth. Wow. It's incredible. And speaking of the inverse, uh, we've got a bunch of u- neurologists in the UK working with a hospital in Walton to switch their uh, intensive care unit over 
to a circadian friendly lighting solution, especially in the cover rooms, and we are seeing recovery times come down in those rooms. And what does that mean when they, when they say that? Does it mean bright lights during the day and then, and then warming and dimming at sunset and then darkness and then back? What does it all mean, Scott? Yeah, so we're talking about a follow the sun sort of solution where you start out pretty dim in the morning on the warmer side, you peak up to very bright, very white to blue light around lunch and after, and that comes right back down towards sunset. You know, what I've noticed about hospitals is they could also, and we've talked about it on this show before, is the sound. There's too much beeping and bopping going on in hospitals and people are trying to run, beep, boop. I mean, you know, I've had uh, loved ones in the hospital and I've had to bring them Bose Quiet Comfort headphones so they could they could actually sleep because there's so much beeping and bopping and bing, 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 bomb, bomb, bomb. And the darkness, it, it, like, listen, the sound and the darkness are almost one and the same. I mean, this is not the Restoring Silence podcast, but it could be Scott Walker. And so that tranquility, which well, is one of one of our great guests talked about, is restoring tranquility. Yes, yes, please, as soon as possible. I bet you that helps human health. <laughs> And, and the health well, of the uh, wildlife, which is the outdoor light pollution, give them back their tranquility, Scott Walker. Well, this is an absolute tangent, but there's uh, this Japanese-American woman. She's a uh, musician and a composer, and she spent uh, about a year in a hospital dealing with cancer. And she's actually now partnered with a medical supply company, company to redesign all of the, beep, the beeps and boops of, on one brand. Mm. Specifically to bring the registers into areas that... You know, you you can still hear, but are more comfortable for the occupants. Well, I don't think the beeps and boops are for the patients. So no, maybe, and yeah, the nurses. Well, what they what they're finding is that nurses are distracted by it just as much. That you get, uh, you get, you get mm. an alarm beep, and it gets lost in the regular beeps. Yes, like I couldn't agree more. Like you're sitting there in a room, you're trying to say beep, beep. Your heart, your heart rate's being beeped on the side and there's a light coming out of it. And then there's a light over here shining over here from this machine. And it's very hard to recover. I mean, I, 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 you know, and so it's light pollution, sound pollution. It's happening in the recovery room. So we got rid of the light pollution and guess what? People recovered faster. Let's get rid of the sound pollution too. I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm, you know, we're not gonna start the, re, you know, the, the sound and silence foundation right now, but it's almost the same thing, Scott Walker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that is what we're gonna, that is three weeks worth, of new, weeks worth of news. We'll come back next time, I think. Yeah, so folks, uh, you know, on normal occasions, you know, when Scott Walker and I get together, it's just going to be the last seven days. But this time, where it's the first time of the show. But you know what I want you to do right now? This work. Scott Walker is a professional. He reads all the darkness news all week long. And he, pre- he prepares a report. And he puts it out on the Lighting Industry News Brief, Darkness News, and he puts it on the website. It's all there for you, folks. You go to restoringdarkness.com, and you can check out the news. You can check out episodes of the show. But you know what else you can do? You can click the Donate button. That's right. You can support this great work. we got Scott Griffin in the studio here who spent a lot of time creating all of this. we got Scott Walker doing all the news. And we got the Board of Directors that um, are volunteering their time to... Um, there we go. I just got to move over out of the logo there. I'm getting it's new. I'm new to this, folks. So just give me a bit of time um, to to move around and then a whole new show format. But we're starting a new show and we're serious about this. We're not taking any prisoners. We are going to work towards this with education, with research, with awareness creation, and with support to our friends on the ground in various communities that need help, that need that need that need technical support, maybe even legal support. We don't know yet. We're going to try our best. But you know what it all relies upon? It relies upon you, all those folks out there that are sick of the, this now. They're sick of the, the, the excuses. This is a solvable environmental problem, folks, and we can fix it. So I want you to go to restoringdarkness.com right now. Click that donate button. Why not become a monthly donor? Why not? What else are you giving to? You know, and, and, and this issue is, is something that, you know, um, is dear to all our hearts, seeing the stars, restoring darkness, preserving night, helping the wildlife. Um, the, you heard about all the things that Scott Walker was talking about in his amazing reporting that he did. Three weeks of news right there. What a, what a great report Scott put together. The team's here, guys. We're serious about this. So go to restoringdarkness.com. Click the donate button right now. I got Dr. Kimberly Arcon, Jill Johnson, and Stephen Loring about their 
latest display at the Smithsonian. Lights out, recovering our night sky. You know, I'm so excited to hear it. And I can't wait for you guys to hear it as well. So let's go. Evluma, illuminating the pursuit of dark skies. Welcome back to the Restoring Darkness podcast. I have a very exciting show today. Um, I am joined by Jill Johnson, Dr. Kimberly Arcond, and Stephen Loring. Jill Johnson is the exhibit developer and project manager at the Office of Exhibits at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. She's worked there since 1979, 44 years. Seven of those were spent with the Marine Systems Laboratory at the museum. She has a bachelor's degree in marine science from Southampton College slash Long Island University. She had the work opportunity to work on many exhibitions, permanent and temporary. Some of the highlights have been the Sant Ocean Hall that opened in 2008, renovation of the famous African elephant display twice. The temporary exhibition currently on display is Objects of Wonder from the collections of the National Museum of Natural History, highlighting fabulous objects from our museums, the museum's vast collections from the seven research departments and the newly opened temporary exhibit, which we're going to talk about today called Lights Out, Recovering Our Night Sky. I think that's such an interesting name and we're going to unpack it a little bit more. I'm also joined by Stephen Loring. Stephen was born and brought up in Concord, Massachusetts. Like earlier Concordians, Henry Thoreau comes to mind. He spent a disproportionate time in the neighboring woods and rivers, often in the company of one or another pet raccoons. A proclivity at finding things and the drift of his thoughts and imagination in a decidedly antiquarian bent led him eventually to become an archaeologist. He attended Goddard College in Vermont and later the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, where he, he went got his PhD in. He taught anthropology and northern studies at Middlebury College and the University of South Carolina prior to accepting a job with the Smithsonian's Arctic Studies Center in 1992. He has conducted archaeological and ethno-historical fieldwork, much in, con in conjunction with Native communities throughout New England, um, Alaska, and Eastern Canada, almost continuously since 1975. Wow. Dr. Kimberly Arcand is a leading expert in, this is really cool, astronomy, astronomy visualization and has been a pioneer in 3D imaging, printing, and extended reality applications with astrophysics data. She has worked for NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory since 1998. Her current research includes sonification of spatial data, machine learning as applied to image processing, and other intersections of emerging technology and astrophysics. Welcome Stephen, Jill, and Kimberly to the Restoring Darkness podcast. I'm, I'm going to start uh, with Jill and I'm going to ask you, I really like the name of your, of your exhibit because it's a call to action as well as a name. Lights Out, Recovering Our Night Sky. Tell us a little bit about the exhibit and why you chose that name. The exhibit is focusing on the loss of the night sky due to light pollution. And so there are things that we can do pretty simple things that we can do to recover our view of the night sky. And when we initially uh, did some testing with visitors to just, to just get an idea of this topic, what they thought about it, um, do some title testing, this resonated the most mm. with people who really had not had an experience with a dark sky site. And so we thought, you know, because they haven't seen that, and their understanding that we might need to recover the loss of the night sky because they're not they're not perceiving it they're not seeing it maybe in their neighborhood maybe they haven't had the opportunity um but it also has that active sense of it recover and mm -hmm. that brings the the solution side of it the the average american has has never seen the Milky Way, I would bet. I don't know that to be the case, but I, I would bet that, that they've never seen the Milky Way. As a Canadian, I've uh, most of our country is actually a, a dark sky reserve if you go 100 kilometers or miles north or whatever it is. Um, Stephen, 
you know, in Western culture, we have this idea of the night being bad or, you know, Christ being the light of the world or all this sort of stuff is embedded deeply into, into Western culture. Can we learn anything from our First Nations and Native communities about the value of the night sky? Well, of course we can if we just open our eyes and ears. We, um, we, we felt very strongly in, in thinking about this exhibit in, in the planning stage, it was such a, a, a good fix for the Natural History Museum you know, because we're, the problem with light pollution affects all life on Earth, you know, from plants and animals and insects. And, and then, of course, it resonates strongly with human beings. And we, in, in thinking about this exhibit and putting it together, we just, we realize that the, the night sky is part of humanity's common heritage. It's something that mm -hmm. all people for all times have shared. And so, in, in, in my involvement with the position was was just trying to broaden out that perspective of um, of, the, of the fact that different people all over the world you know have related to the night sky as a source of inspiration and wonder and 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 figuring out you know where we are who we are what it is to be a human being what it is to be life on earth um, and 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 that was part of our premise we didn't want it to be um, you know, dominated by a Western perspective as much as as sharing this this idea that that uh, people all over the world have had an intimate experience, and f I spent a good portion of my professional career in Canada, uh, in the Canadian Arctic and uh, subarctic area. Spent a lot of time out in the country um, with uh, Indigenous, uh, uh, Indian, and and First Nations and Inuit peoples, uh, and 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 just. To, to go out from the camp in the nighttime, I argue it's never dark. You know, the brilliance of the stars mm. is enough to uh, mm -hmm. to see you well. So, so one of the things we also were exploring this whole like, what does it mean to be dark, and 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 how much light is enough light? You know, it, it's interesting because I find that, and I and, and I love the work the people at the IDA do, the International Dark Skies Association, but I find the term dark skies a little bit confusing at times for people and that's why you know our board of directors here insisted on restoring darkness and preserving night as the language we're going to use in the from the lighting industry perspective of the distributors that i represent um to discuss the issue so that it becomes clearer for people but you know the spiritual aspect of it um is so important or the human aspect of it kimberly how did you incorporate that into your design in, in the in the 3D imaging and the astronomy visualization to kind of pass along what, what we're all missing? Well, I mean, depending on your perspective, you could say that the universe either belongs to everyone or belongs to no one. Right? Are you glass half full, glass empty kind of person? Mm -hmm. um, but the idea stands, right? We should all have access to something that people that have come before us have all had access to for a very long time. And for me, someone who has kind of like this front row seat in the cathedral of the universe, just through the telescopes that I get to use, I feel like I have this very lucky sense of all of that beyond us. And, you know, it keeps me endlessly humble, of course, but also mm. endlessly in awe. And, and to be able to have even just a tiny part of that by just being able to look up through your night sky, wherever you might be every day, I think is, is really important. So, yeah, we should all be able to just look up and enjoy it. Have you been able to, uh, have the observers of your exhibit, have they, have they come out sort of with their minds blown, so to speak, or like really being able to visualize the, the stars? Well, Jill, I don't know if you have any feedback yet. Uh, well, you know, we have not done it. it notably. <laughs> we haven't done any kind of, um, uh, you know, official evaluation at all, but I can say yes, because <laughs> it's packed, it's packed. And people are just, especially in a theater experience we have, where they can go out to a night sky in Countersport, Pennsylvania, in a dark sky park from dusk to dawn, and uh, actually experience uh, the Milky Way, the sky just full of stars and then interpreted through um three different cultures 
and the Pleiades star cluster. Mm. So we introduce the Pleiades star cluster, and then we interpret it from a Greek perspective, an Ainu Japan perspective, and a, a Maori New Zealand perspective. Mm. So different cultures are all telling a story about the same star cluster that people can see around the world and people in the theater are actually getting to experience in Countersport, Pennsylvania. And it is a small theater and we were thinking, you know, maybe three benches and people, it, it's packed. People come out of there like, wow. Um, and you just see them enjoying all of the different uh, amazing photographs. It is primarily a photo show and just can see that this is something that a lot of people just have not experienced. The exhibit itself is very dark. So you already come into a dark space and then these images uh, from around the world just pop out at you. And um, I think that they're just really having a terrific experience in the exhibit. Hmm. How do we convince, I mean, part of the problem here, you know, in the lighting industry and then the larger community, uh, I think people see light pollution as a metaphor rather than something that's actually a real thing that's a, that causes environmental damage. How do we, how do we change that awareness? I think this, this display is important, impo important part of that. But it, do you guys feel the same way as I do that there is, there's this, this feeling that light pollution is not a real kind of pollution, actually. It's just like we're just saying that to, to get you the idea that maybe, you know, this is not, you know, it's more like a, uh, a light trespass. It's not really pollution. How do we, is there, you know, beyond th this, is, it, do you guys feel that I'm right about that? And if so, can we change it? Is it going to be hard to change? Stephen? Yes. Well, I think it's, it's, it's very much built into our exhibit. So there's a wonder component which which uh so there's this there's a wonder component which which is brought out by the photography i think mm -hmm. but then there's there's sections within the exhibit that deal with the consequences of light pollution to birds during the migration period with this being distracted by lights to the apocalypse that's happening with insect populations throughout the world as they're drawn by light but also to aspects of sea life and 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 um, and plants uh, that, that, that there's consequences of urban light pollution and I think that's there's a very powerful uh, display we have of, of mounted birds that have been collected from beneath buildings or they've been um, distracted and, and, and killed by striking that. And, and the important aspect, I think, the come, the, one of the take-homes of the exhibit that's very important um, is that this is a problem that can be dealt with. And we, we have examples of cities mm -hmm. that have, have turned off their bright lights or some of their distracting uh, advertising signage during the times of migration, you know, and, and, uh, and, and also um, uh, communities surrounding some of the observatories that, that maybe Kim could speak to that have redirected their lighting uh, so as not to disturb the uh, observation, you know, potential of the, of the telescopes. So it's, it, it is a problem. I mean, we you know, we want to wow people like, like, look at these amazing things that are available to us to see. But also this is, this isn't a, this isn't a doom and gloom. This is, this is a, a set of problems that we can deal with. That's such a wonderful um a position to take and you know we have it from our perspective over here is that the good news about light pollution is it's largely a solvable problem it, the, the technology sure. exists it's not a research and development issue um, you know you take a look at things like carbon um, uh, climate change and I mean that's a really that's we don't know how we're gonna do it and um, but with you know darkness restoration would contribute to that problem because we would use a lot less energy and then on top of that um, we already have all the technology we need the the lighting control systems the shielded lights the low kelvin temperature everything's already there kimberly tell us expand on what steven was saying though he mentioned you when he was talking there if you could expand a little bit on how what what some of the cities are doing in, in areas where there are uh, telescopes yeah i i think like as he mentioned one of the very positive things about this issue is just that 
the individual can participate and feel like they are making a difference. They can in they can participate on a very small local level, just within their own home of just turning off the lights. Mm-hmm. Um, and even doing such also just helps reduce energy usage and carbon footprint in general. Like there's small things that the individual can do immediately. But then with just another extra step or two, that impact can reverberate as soon as you get to the next level. If you're in an apartment building or if you work at a school and you can help change how the school lights their field at night, or you can go a step bigger and go to your town council or or whatever it might be. Like there are a series of steps that individuals can take or that communities can take in order to combat this. And it's particularly being done in some areas around um, observatories, for example, but elsewhere throughout the world too. Um, There are some wonderful locations in places like Scotland, for example, um, where they have um, literal times of no lights at all. Like they have completely Hmm. shut off lights and have found it to be conducive to tourism, which is great, Mm -hmm. um, but also just as a way of returning to a more sort of community focused um, lens, right? And so I feel like it's just, it just gives me a sense of hope, I think, in general, overall, because it can feel stressful and frustrating with these larger issues of climate change that you can't have any impact. Um, But as an individual, you can have some agency here with light pollution. And I think that's a really wonderful thing. I agree. You know, one of the, one of the, you know, you, you, you come across these memes on the internet from sometimes I go on the internet, I probably shouldn't, but (laughs) I saw this one post um, on a social media platform and it showed North Korea and South Korea and uh, North Korea was completely dark and South Korea was completely light polluted. The entire half of the peninsula was coated with with light and this was seen as a symbol of the success of the western um socio-capitalist system over communism and we need to invert that right like that needs to change is that actually the sign of intelligent life on earth now should be really um the rest- restoration and preservation of night and darkness jill do you have any does your you you're, you're, again the lights out recovering our night is there a call to action at the end for people to to tell them really to get involved in the movement? There's a call to action throughout the exhibit, throughout the exhibit. And we use um, essential questions is what we is the way we term it throughout the exhibit. They're questions that don't necessarily have an answer, but get people thinking how much light is en- at night is enough. Who gets to decide mm. who needs the dark? Um, just to get people to ponder that. And um, we have that example of North and South Korea uh, on a map in our exhibit. It's a global map that shows a satellite view of the earth at night. And we identify what are these light sources? Where is this coming from? And some of it is really surprising. Um, some of it is is our use of resources. Mm. Um, some of it are it, just example, incredibly brightly lit roads. Well, we can do something about that. Mm-hmm. And so in the exhibit, we give examples. We have success stories. We, we label that as such as a graphic treatment, whether it be for sea turtles in Florida, whether it's the Smithsonian um, taking its own action to you know light downward and not out into the sky, um, whether it's, um, an indigenous community, um, the Kaibab Paiute that Paiute that have a dark sky community, they're protecting their their night skies. Um, I think one of the things I was just given a tour on Saturday, and um, people are surprised that there are dark sky uh, that we're preserving dark skies like we preserve national parks and mm-hmm. and landscapes or we pre- we have marine sanctuaries and we're preserving parts of the ocean they were really interested in in knowing that there are actually places that we are specifically preserving the night sky international dark sky association um and seeking that out you know and knowing that they can go find places where they're going to be able to see uh, a night sky in all its glory but some of those can simply be in your own backyard Mm -hmm. giving people tips. How do you get out, get near water, get up a little higher, get out in a big open space and um, giving them examples, very specific examples. Like we were talking about of um, what, what light bulb to pick, what kind of light shield we've got Mm. interactives that show people 
how this glaring light actually is hiding what you might need to see. And as you just bring your light down, mm. you can see exactly what you want, but you can also see the night sky. So I live on a farm and um, I often turn off all the lights in my house and all the outdoor lighting um, in the evening just to, to take a look at the stars. And even the local light around you, the local light from your home or in your, you know, in your, in, from your house, that if you turn that off, that will contribute to this a lot. But, you know, one of the things is that, you know, Stephen, we're trying to change the lighting industry into the lighting and darkness industry. It, it's taking a lot of work, actually, to, um, you know, convince lighting people to start with darkness instead of starting with light. And, the, you know, there's a lot of barriers. Um, some of them are policy-wise and laws, local laws and bylaws and these types of things. We need to work on that. And, um, you know, I think this Smithsonian exhibit, Stephen, is, is starting to create that kind of awareness in the general population that we need in order to, for this movement to begin to start flowing into our, 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 our policymaking. Um, is there any, has, has any congressmen or women come down and check out the, the, uh, the any politicians <laughs> been down yet to check it out? Well... <laughs> You know, th this is a town full of such, and mm -hmm. uh, if not the the senators and congressmen themselves, perhaps their staffers and and people. So I'm I'm not exactly sure on that question, but um, um, more to the point, I I, I think um, if we start with the notion of wonder, if we lure them in, mm. you know, with these spectacular photography, and 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 Jill hasn't mentioned, but we we, we also had a real um, uh, commitment to try to make this a multi-sensorial experience, you know, so there's mm. a lot of sounds of the night, you know, crickets and frogs and things like that, but also um, it's kind of some very innovative uh, things that our, our, our vision impaired people can participate in well, um, uh, star maps and things like that, that they can touch and, 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 exp and have some clue to the concepts of, of which we're talking about. So what we're, we're we're very pleased with that, um, but uh, so I, I you know I think that's the you know the responsibility of the museum right um, is to sort of create that intellectual space and you know when we started out well before COVID so it was you know four years ago we started thinking about this and it was a new idea for all of us um, you know what do we have in the museum that can sort of resonate with this issue. Um, but since then, I just think there's been a wealth of, it's an emerging issue, you know, that, that uh, uh, people you begin to see editorials in newspapers and, and, and some of the environmental literature um, is, is focusing on it. And, and, and certainly the astronaut, you know, the astronomy people and, and the amateur uh, astronomy pho photographic community and what have you um, are, are, are all been, you know, preaching this for some time now. And so I think it's just, I, I think the Smithsonian is a national uh, pulpit is a good place to uh, get some of these ideas mm -hmm. out and bring it into common discourse. So the, you know, I interviewed Dr. Jesse Barber um, a couple weeks ago, and he, he talks about sensory pollution and how noise and light pollution are often together and, um, and, you know, you, you say, well, it's, it's restoring silence, but I think that's the same thing as saying dark skies. It's actually the night is not quiet either. Um, if you allow it to um, come through, Jill, you're, 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 you're shaking your head. Do you have anything to expand on that, this idea of sensory pollution as being um, something we want to eliminate at night? Well, I think that one of the things, this is this experience we have with people going out uh, and we include the sounds, you know, that it isn't quiet, just like it isn't dark per se, mm. um, that it's actually, it can be a really bright sky, um, but it also allows, allows us to share with people that there's a, there's a whole community out there at night and get to, get to meet the nightlife. We have one section of the exhibit that says meet the nightlife. And so we've got pictures of the kinds of things that you might see at night, including flowering plants like cactus, um, bats, insects, marine life, mammals, lots and lots and lots of mammals are out or nocturnal. So that there is this, this diurnal cycle and that a lot of things are out at night. And, um, 
listen to them. You get to experience them. We found that some people are afraid. You know, mm-hmm. they 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 connect mm-hmm. light at night, artificial light at night, with safety, mm-hmm. and that was something we really had to address and and acknowledge, right? And so, being able to share with people, you can have lighting that's very safe, that is not anywhere near as intrusive as the kind of light you might think you need. And let's let's get let's introduce some of these uh, sounds. At, at, mm. at night and and where are they coming from so that you can begin to feel more comfortable and begin to feel more familiar yeah the safety trap is a tough one um to overcome because there's there's evidence on both sides i mean there's lots of evidence that more light equals less crime i'm not saying safety but there is evidence that and you know i argued that maybe there's different kinds of crimes happening with different kinds of lighting right um but yes yeah, so definitely lighting can be used to create the feeling of safety. Um, if you ask people, you know, uh, you know, in a lawsuit, they're always, they're always going to say you didn't have enough light. I mean, even there was a case where someone was coming through a tunnel and the lights were so bright that, um, when they came out of the tunnel, there was an accident and the person had said they couldn't see when they came out because of the contrast. And the answer of course, is just more light, right? But not less light. Right. And so we have this default in our legal system um, and in our regulations, like even the highway regulations here. If you change the lighting on the highway and there was an accident, there might be a lawsuit against the town and against the highway and authority and all this kind of stuff. So there's lots of work to do, I think, at the at the policy level and the and the and the law level. Um, but there is a sense that there is movement in this direction. But is it only a rural thing? So when you were when you're demonstrating this, Jill. Are you only speaking of rural environments or can we have pleasant darkness in our cities or is that impossible? No, I think that is something that we really wanted to bring out and this um, get to, uh, tips we gave people are actually showing people in, a, you know, in Central Park. You can go out in Central Park and you can take a telescope and you're going to see planets and you're going to see stars and you're going to be able to get just a glimpse of a night, get near water. You know, you might be near a city, but um, we use an example, it's Fountain Hills, Arizona, where they are dark sky community now, and they are near the water, um, preserving this amazing night sky. We have pictures of kids out on the mall in Washington, DC on an astronomy night and um, what they can see. Uh, or just an example of in a community, what you can do, changing your lighting, uh, and you're in the middle of a city, and you can see a lot more stars. Mm-hmm. Um, we talk about you know getting out and just let your eyes adjust a little bit. You know, just let your eyes adjust and start to look and and see in places that you might not have thought to look before. You can probably see a lot more in a suburban backyard than you think. You know, I, I've often thought that the, the loss of our night sky has done serious damage to our psyche and i i know it sounds um crazy but humans are not a nocturnal species that doesn't mean we don't go out at night and look at the stars but there definitely seems to be um something missing and what you were talking about seeing things better i think we could do that for everything actually <laughs> we could stop and think about the things that we're doing and how we're you know doing things and hopefully this movement here um can can help us kimberly um tell me a little bit about how you um what is sonification of spatial data actually first before I, I, uh, <laughs> before I ask sure. about it? <laughs> um, it's just this idea of translating data into sound, but particularly for immersive environments like virtual reality, sorry, space cat here, um, virtual reality or extended reality of some kind when you have that sort of geospatial um, data point where you can attach sound to it so that if you're going through some sort of VR, you understand where you are in relation to the data, not just through vision, but also through sound. Um, And we did use sonification techniques in this exhibit as well, because we really wanted to be both immersive and multi-sensory and also very accessible and inclusive. Um, So we actually took the Bortle scale, for example, which is this scale that helps you kind of grade the amount of light pollution um, in your area or across areas and doing a very simplified version of the Boral scale to reduce it just to a few um, chunks. What we did was apply sound to that data so that as you're 
experiencing it, you'll hear more like white noise and um, stuff, right? In these noisier, more light polluted areas and versus when you're in a more dark sky area, you'll just hear the, the twinkle, the sort of natural twinkle, if you will, of those stars. So long answer to your short question, but that's what sonification is. <laughs> And so, and this is obviously in the exhibit, um, how do you um, decide or how do you, like, it's, it almost sounds like you're like a science experience designer or something. Um, how do you go sure. about, yeah. yeah, how do you go about deciding what you're going to do and what sounds you're going to use? Well, it's a mathematical mapping from the data so that it is highly representative of the data that we have, but we absolutely have subjectivity in the choices of what we're applying to that data mapping. And in this case, um, we're working with some wonderful colleagues at System Sounds that are also sound engineers and musicians to make sure that the sounds are appropriate for the data, authentic to the data, but still um, express the data in a way that is, you know, aesthetic, auditorily wise. Um, and it's really important to pay attention to that because particularly when you're working with and for blind and low vision communities, you want to make sure that the data translation, if you will, from sight to sound is something that will make sense for their community, mm. is something that will help create the mental map of that data. So it's not just, um, you know, translating something into sound to make it sound pretty so it sounds catchy and has a good tune. It's about making sure there's a distinction between those sounds so that as you can create a mental map, you're understanding what pieces of that data you're sort of creating with. And so, yeah, it's this whole process of essentially taking information and mapping into another experience that we can have. Tell me about the data. Where do you, where does the data come from and, and what is it exactly? What is it that you're, 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 you're sonif sonifying? <laughs> well, so in the exhibit, we were sonifying the essential like images, if you will, that exemplify that part of the Bortle scale. So the dark sky mm. was really like, the image pictured behind you, lots of stars, nice strong band of the Milky Way, all of the pockets of brightness and darkness that that Milky Band contain. And then, of course, sliding over to the other side in a more urban, you know, city environment, just mm. bright sort of light fog that's canvassing the sky and just a couple bright points of light like you might expect in a very light polluted area. And so it's taking that image and it's mathematically mapping the pixels in that image into the auditory experience. What does um, light so pollution sound like? Get that process. What does... Well, it sounds like noise, like white noise, <laughs> if you will. And mm. the lack of the beauty of the heavens, mm. right? So it takes you instead of having a little mini symphony of sound with all of the twinkling gorgeousness that is our Milky Way and stars around it. Instead, it's more like a TV that's been partially disconnected and no longer, you mm -hmm. know, plays anything that's all that exciting. Um, so yeah, there's just a, a different way to experience it. What an emotional roller coaster. Steven, what, what did, um, what did you add to the exhibit from the archeological perspective? Or the anthropological perspective, whichever one. Yes, one of the uh, one of the, the driving factors of the exhibit was trying to include things from the natural museums, the, the natural history museums collections, and so we took a quick dive into the anthropology holdings because we wanted to broaden out the perspective of the night sky, and and uh, in addition, uh, we, we we were cognizant of trying to get imagery uh, from all over the world. So we do from the poles and from all the continents of the world. But we also wanted to um, have some objects from our anthropology collections that resonate with stories about the night sky. And and, and so we had some uh, lovely Yupik masks from Alaska that was collected in the 1880s that depicted um, a Yupik uh, uh, um, uh, Spiritual deities uh, mm. that 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 lived in the in the sky, uh, stars and moons and and their associates. Uh, also, we have a wonderful uh, winter uh, count uh, calendar, uh, which was a Plains Indian no notational device where they would uh, inscribe an an event from each year that would sort of become a visual almanac in which uh, people could. Uh, uh, tell stories about the passing of time and some of the specific events of specific years, like a, 
unusual, uh, um, spectacular meteorite shower that was mm. observed throughout most of the northern hemisphere was recorded and then eclipses and things like that. Um, but um, to our delight, when when we have these opportunities at the museum, and we're always cognizant of the fact that we do have these wonderful treasures from indigenous communities from around the world, mm. but it's always important for us to stress that m many of these communities are, are still ongoing. You know, people are, are, are still sure. uh, active today. And, and so we use an opportunity like this um, to sort of try to reach out to some contemporary artisans, contemporary community representatives to maybe produce artwork that's inspired by the night sky. And in this case, we were extremely lucky because there's a wonderful Gwich'in woman from the Northwest Territories named Margaret Nansen, who does um, a bead work. She's a, a traditional seamstress and, and, and bead worker, but she has been so inspired by both visions that a photograph she saw from taken from the Hubble Space Scope telescope, but also from her own experiences walking out from her community under the night sky to produce these extraordinary beaded panels, um, which which we have, um, in, one of which we have in the exhibit. So, uh, and to me, it's quite a delight because it, it sparkles and catches wow. the light uh, as you walk through the exhibit, anyway, much like the night sky does as well. So it, it, it is an opportunity to, to share with the audience that, um, people's experiences vary, but also it is a common factor around the world. And, and we have historical photographs going back to to um, the, the Lascaux cave caverns and some of the Paleolithic uh, uh, caves uh, in France, you know, where there are symbols painted on the cave walls mm. that many people have interpreted as, as constellations and aspects of the night sky. So... Well, archaeology, and and again, you know, not to tell you about your own discipline, <laughs> but I mean, you rarely hear something in archaeology that's not oriented to the uh, to some star system or some sunset or sunrise or some sort of natural phenomenon, and the and, and the constellations continually continually pop up um, in that. And so, as a you know, we, you know, we don't look at ourselves as a species so much. <laughs> You know, but if if we did, I, I think we would see that in, in the modern world, in our world now, we're missing something and we're missing that connection to the universe. Absolutely. And and we explore that theme a little bit, you know, with a little bit of the history of astronomy, which segues right into Kim's work um, with with radio astronomy and 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 the. You know, I, I, Kim brings to the exhibit deep time, you know, so, you know, I, I may be mired in the recent 10,000 years of human uh, activities, but, but Kim's insights uh, just to the profound understanding of what is existence, you know, it's like, w what is it that, that uh, we're part of in, the, in, in this universal uh, vision and, and an appreciation or, or, or a way of accessing that kind of experience and knowledge is threatened by light pollution. You know, uh, whenever uh, we used to start off the show by, by um, in the old days when we first started the, this podcast, by asking people to give us an, a time when they experienced the awe of the night sky. And, you know, several times, um, you know, it sounded as if they were on psychedelic drugs. I mean, I'm not kidding you. Um, you know, there was, you know, some people would describe it, uh, in the same, like if you just took out, you know, the constellations or whatever and put in, you know, psilocybin, it <laughs> might be the same thing. Kimberly, uh, we want to wrap this up. So we're going to give you the second last word and then we're going to go over to Jill. Kimberly, final thoughts for the Restoring Darkness listeners. Yeah. I mean, so I work in astronomy and I do kind of have this front row seat and I want everybody to participate in that with me. But, you know, part of it is I grew up in a more rural part of my state and had access to an incredible part of the night sky and would dream about it. Like such the, such the, so much so that my parents actually got me a stellarium so I could like have the stars on my bedroom ceiling as I fell asleep. Mm. Um, so to have gone through from that to today, working on this exhibit with Jill and Steven, the whole crew, um, working with experts across the Smithsonian and across really the world to kind of piece together the story to tell 
um, it's just been such a joy because I really do hope that people can take away from this that we need the night sky, not just for ourselves as selfish humans, but also as mm. part uh, members of a planet that, you know, we're sharing this planet with other um, species, creatures, ecosystems, and it's our responsibility to make sure we do what we can in order to support the others on the planet with us. So, yeah, I mean, the night sky might belong to us or to all of us or to no one, but we really do have a responsibility to make sure that we're not crowding it out. Jill, it's a temporary exhibit, Lights Out, Recovering Our Night Sky. Tell me how long it's going for, and yeah, tell me a little bit for final thoughts here for the listeners. So the exhibit's going to be at our museum uh, through December 2025, and then Smithsonian Institution Traveling Exhibits is going to make a smaller footprint of it and is going to travel it for probably, I don't know, five, eight years around wow. certainly the United States in smaller venues. Um, but so it will live on um, and uh, maybe be in, you know, somebody's backyard, somebody's community. And um, I think the, the to sort of wrap it up, when we first went out and asked visitors about their night sky, we found these two different groups, those that had experienced it like you were describing. Mm -hmm. They could tell you in detail what they saw. And in and for those that had only seen it a couple times, um, it was so memorable. It was just, you know, implanted in there and they could just describe it in great detail. Then we we had this other group that really hadn't seen it or hadn't thought about it or maybe was afraid to go out. And so those are our two target groups, those that are passionate about it because they've seen it, those that don't really know a lot about it because they haven't really been outside. And so what we hope is our exhibit is going to inspire both of those groups mm. to do something, go out and find that night sky, and then realize there are really simple things I can do in my backyard, in my community, in my neighborhood um, to preserve, preserve uh, night sky for, for future generations. It's a simple, um, solvable problem. You know what? I'm also hoping that the, that, this issue joins the general environmental movement, you know, plastics in the ocean, carbon emissions and these kinds of things. And that those, those, those environmentalists, if they're listening, embrace this. This is a solvable one. We can get this done and it will contribute to that. It'll definitely use less energy. Um, and so, yeah. And, and, you know, guys, I'm going to put the uh, link to the uh, exhibit on the restoringdarkness.com website. So if you if you're looking for that, you can go there. Um, and for now, I'm going to say thank you to Jill, Stephen, and Kimberly for joining me today on the Restoring Darkness podcast. Great. And thank you very much thank for having you. us. Thank you. All right. Look no further for dark sky friendly products than Evluma. Since its first product launch, Evluma has carried one or more International Dark Sky Association certified models. If your customer cares about light pollution, suggest the Omnimax with shielding or the Area Max with full cutoff to reduce uplight and glare. Evluma, illuminating the pursuit of darkness.